this episode, we are going to look at a story from the Greek mythology about how the world's first spider was born and also one of the worst enemies of mankind, hubris or eagle. Hi, I'm Sean and welcome to Mythos of the World podcast, where I retell some incredible and insightful stories from around the world. The first time Aratni saw a weaving loom, she was just a toddler. As she watched her mother weave, Aratni's big eyes lit up with excitement. With a beaming smile and absolute determination in her eyes and overflowing cuteness, she crawled as fast as she could towards the loom. Aratni was the daughter of a renowned purple dyer in ancient Lydia, modern-day Turkey. Those times, purple garments were worn by royalty. A lot of hard work and care went into producing it, so it was very expensive. Arachne's father, Idmon, produced the best purple dye in the whole region, so business was good and life was great. Arachne, being the couple's only child, was brought up with a lot of love. But no matter how hard she tried to crawl her way to the loom, she would not be allowed to touch it. She would always be picked up just before. Of course, her parents at that time thought it was just another object the toddler was curious to explore. But little did they know that every time she crawled towards the loom, every attempt she made to touch it, Athena herself, goddess of arts and wisdom, was smiling upon their daughter. As time went along, Aragni had grown into a young girl and she was taught all house responsibilities young girls performed at that time. By now, her parents also began to realize that there might be something more than just an infant curiosity towards the loom. So they taught her all things around weaving and she learned it all with great enthusiasm. She learned to shear the sheep and collect the wool. She mastered shearing so well, the sheep gave her no resistance. Just by a quick glance at the wool, she could tell which part of the sheep the wool came from, so she would sort them effortlessly. She didn't leave a single part out. She learned to clean the wool, card them, then learned how to prepare it so it could be woven into a yarn. When she sat on the wheel to spin the wool into a yarn, she spun it so well it seemed as if the yarn came from her hands itself, just like that of a spider spinning its web. Though she learned all different aspects of it, when she sat to weave, she was in the zone. For hours and hours she would practice weaving. Her father taught her everything he knew about purple dye. While some of his counterparts usually dyed the fabric blue and then red, to create purple, Edmond preferred to collect secretions from a specific sea snails to produce purple dye. It took tens and thousands of snails and was a huge laborious task. But her father was proud of his craft and found so much joy in producing it to the best of his ability. Arachne, also like her father, wanted to do things to the best of her ability. After having learned about purple dye from her father, she travelled to nearby towns and villages on foot to meet other dyers and learned how to create other colours. Of course, having come from a wealthy family, she could have easily travelled to these places on a cart, but she preferred to walk, because on her walks she would see beautiful sceneries and she would observe the everyday lives of her fellow citizens. She saw love, hatred, sadness, anger and humour in places where others didn't see. Sometimes she felt like larger forces were at play throughout the nature, moving her and the world, and she often felt humbled by them. Arachne was growing into a beautiful young woman, and her mastery over weaving was growing even faster. She had begun to weave more than patterns and clothes. She wove beautiful scenarios 
and she was able to imbue them with great liveliness that was never seen before. She had become a master weaver. The word began to spread of a wonderful weaver whose work came alive, whose images themselves told wonderful tales. More and more people started to arrive. Though they initially came to see the display of her work, they began to realize that watching Arachne weave was just as mesmerizing. So naturally an audience began to grow just to watch her weave. Now a beautiful young maiden, Arachne had become a household name to the locals and even extending to the nearby towns. Many young girls aspired to be a weaver just like her. But Arachne's audience was not limited to nearby towns. It extended even to the celestial realm. The nymphs, who were beautiful feminine nature spirits, who made the rivers flow, the trees grow and flowers bloom, who were the weavers of nature's beauty itself, came to watch Arachne. Arachne herself had developed such a state of mind that she was able to feel the presence of the nymphs and even hear them. She would often feel honored and even proud at times that even they came to watch her. One day, as Arachne was weaving, she heard a group of nymphs converse. Just wash your hands, how it gracefully dances on the loom, said one. Yes, yes, see how her grace and joy spreads to all those watching her, said the other. Arachne looked around the weaving hall, and there she saw her audience. Their faces were so serene and peaceful, as if they were all wrapped in the most comfortable, invisible blanket of some sort. They looked so joyful. Wow, thought Arachne, I am making this happen. Just as then, under the nymph, all praises to Athena. What a wonderful instrument she picked to shine through. What? Athena? How? But I... Arachne wanted to hear what else the nymphs said, but she couldn't hear them anymore. Had they left? She couldn't feel them either. Strange. As the weaving session came to an end and the audience began to disperse, many came to praise her. But amongst them, she also heard praises for Athena. These praises after the session were nothing unusual, it has happened for a long time now. But that day was different. Arachne took the praises to her head and was disappointed at the praises for Athena. They were unfair, she felt. After all, she had put in all the hard work. Determined to put an end to this unfairness, she decided to give little speeches after weaving sessions. Stories about how she walked miles to learn about different techniques in dyeing. How, when the children of her age played outside, she chose to stay in and practice. How she developed the willpower, discipline and devotion to her craft. These stories inspired those who aspired to be like her. They became more determined. They learned how to say no to distractions. How to devote themselves to a purpose. But in Mount Olympus, Athena was growing with concern, for she was able to see through to the heart of these speeches. Slowly and slowly, over time, the joy and serenity Arachne's audience once felt was beginning to diminish. They no longer left with a sense of awe and lightness. Instead, they felt somewhat burdened by life. Arachne's speeches had become more and more about her passion, her commitment, her devotion, her hard work, and on some days they were more talking than weaving. One day, during such a speech about how she had walked for hours to learn the process of creating blue dye, and how she was determined to master it, an elderly woman dressed in a long golden tunic with finely woven purple hemline, gently stepped forward. That's all fine, dear, but you must praise the gods that move through you, for if it wasn't for their blessing, what nonsense, Arachne cut through. Why must I praise them for my hard work? What have they ever done? 
Just because your mind can't grasp, my child, doesn't mean they haven't done anything. Have you not felt the nymphs work through the nature? Have you not heard them speak even? said the elder with a twinkle in her eye. How, how do you? Well, they're not here anymore. Why must I? As Arachne stumbled for words, the elder cut through. Maybe they're still here. Maybe your mind has just become clouded with all this self-grandiosity. How dare you, old woman? The elder, completely ignoring Arachne's anger, continued. Be humble to the forces that move through you, my child. Accept them with grace. Be grateful to Athena, who works through you. I had continued to. Arachne cut through once again. Athena, what has she ever done? I learned all this through my hard work. Why? I can even weave better than Athena herself, the so-called goddess of arts and wisdom. Is that so? Of course, if she were here, I would challenge her to weave against me, and I will prove how she has nothing to do with this. So be it. With those words, the elder transformed into a tall, majestic young woman. It was Athena herself. The audience gasped. Most bowed to her. Arachne was too proud to do so, and some of her adherent fans followed suit. A second loom was set up for Athena. They both sat down and began to weave as the crowd watched. Both master weavers, their fingers moved the shuttle effortlessly gliding through the loom so smoothly, both of them so focused at their work, and the watching crowd were entranced. Athena finished first, and all were taken by the beauty of her work. Even Arachne could not help but stop to admire. On the four corners of Athena's tapestry, there were images of Demeter, Poseidon, Hades and Zeus. Demeter, the goddess of harvest and fertility, showing how she watched over the soil and gave food to the world. Poseidon, riding the waves of the ocean. Hades, burning the fires of the underworld. And Zeus himself, on a white cloud, giving thunder and lightning to the world. Surrounded by these glorious images, in the middle she had woven the tales of humans, who defied the gods, who took from the earth without gratitude, worse, who went far as to think of them better than gods themselves. Images of Icarus, whom despite the warnings from his father, flew so high and close to Apollo, only for his wings to melt and drown into the sea. Images of Salmonius, who thought of himself as equal to Zeus, so he built a bridge out of brass and rode his chariot up and down as fast as he could to mimic the sound of thunder, had his men throw torches in the air to imitate lightning and demanded to his subjects, I am as powerful as Zeus, worship me, at which point Zeus decided to send him a little gift of lightning which took him straight to the realm of Hades. Athena's images were so lifelike. The presence of Demeter and the gods could be felt. The crops danced and the waves of the oceans roared. The fires of Hades emitted heat. And the anguish and torment, the ultimate reward of hubris, were so well woven on Icarus and Salmonius' faces as if they were in the room itself. Arachne could not help but admire the work. It showcased incredible craftsmanship that she has never seen before. The more she saw, the more drawn she became. Her eyes filled with the same wonder that she felt when she saw the loom for the very first time all those years back. And once again she heard the nymphs and they praised Athena, sang her glory as goddess of all art and wisdom. But I can do better. Arachne said to herself and went back to her weaving, with more determination to prove Athena wrong. As Athena leaned over to see Arachne's work, she could see what was beginning to take shape. 
Arachne's tapestry showcased Hades' abduction of Persephone, Demeter's daughter. In anger and retaliation, how Demeter subjected the whole world into famine, including the innocent. It showed helpless sailors and ships sinking under the waves caused by Poseidon. And furthermore, Arachne had begun weaving the exploits of Zeus himself. Arachne's work was imbued with life just as Athena's. And as Athena glanced around the room, she saw how people were already beginning to perceive Arachne's work. Disenchantment was beginning to rise. A sense of uneasiness and anger was filling the hearts of the people. Without further delay, Athena got out of her chair and moved towards Arachne and touched her on her head. Arachne felt a surge of energy rise through her spine. Unable to handle it, she screamed and fell to the ground unconscious. When Arachne woke again, it was dusk. All the crowd had dispersed. Only two of her assistants remained in the weaving hall. One held a torch as the other helped her up. Arachne slowly moved through the hall. Athena's touch had done something to her which she could not quite explain. She asked her assistants to leave, then grabbed a long piece of cloth, covering her head so no one would recognize her. She walked to the town. The town seemed darker than usual. Usually around this time it would be quite festive. People, after a hard days of work, would gather around the temples to pay respect to the gods and then socialize. Temples and streets would be well lit and uplifting spirit all around. But today the temples seemed much dimmer than usual. Only a handful had gathered around the temples, while many others hung about in the streets. As Arachne walked through the streets, she could hear them talk of the gods. What have they ever done for us? They do nothing but abuse their power. Lines like these could be heard quite often. And she saw little girls playing on the streets. I challenge you, Athena, said one girl. Yeah, if you do better than me, I will strike you down, said the other. The disgruntlement against the gods was strong, even in the hearts of the young. What have I done? The guilt Arachne felt had no bound. She walked back to her weaving hall as fast as she could with unbearable pain. Back in the weaving hall, she saw Athena's tapestry on the floor. She picked it up and gently brushed off any dust, straightened it and hung it on the wall. She ran her hands through the tapestry and admired Athena's work. Intricately woven lines, beautifully captured images, each telling a beautiful story. In the middle, along with Icarus and Salmonius, she saw herself. Overcome with grief, tears filled her eyes and rolled down her cheeks. In the gentle, quiet night, as the full moon shined brightly, her cry echoed on the walls. Slowly backing away from the wall, Arachne began to sweep the hall. Once it was immaculately clean, she walked over to her unfinished work and very patiently took it from the loom. Then using the loom itself as a stool, she stood on the top and tied it to the highest beam in the ceiling. Then turning the other end into a noose, she hung herself. In Mount Olympus, the very throne of Athena shook. In absolute shock, she rushed to Arachne as fast as she could. She had only wanted Arachne to see her mistake. After all, she had washed over Arachne from the very moment she was born. But by the time Athena got there, it was too late. Most of Arachne's life force had been drained. Filled with remorse, Athena gently touched Arachne once again. Arachne's tall and beautiful body slowly began to shrink and transform. Her long legs and hands became four pair of legs. Her torso became round. Her eyes multiplied, her teeth turned into fangs. 
the noose she hung on turned into a long line of web. And thus was born the world's first spider. Many tales have been spun ever since. Some say Athena did it out of jealousy and some say she did it out of pity. But there are few who are able to see through to the real enemy, hubris. <laughs>